Over the, the last couple of weeks, uh, one word keeps popping up uh, when I read or when I watch the news. Uh, it's the word draconian. Uh, and uh, some people, as you can uh, see from watching the news, are, are protesting some of the uh, heavy-handed uh, laws put down by uh, governors on how to run states and keep them safe. Uh, draconian might be a word that you're not that familiar with. We don't use it that often. Uh, Miriam Webster gives a good historical background of the term uh, in this fashion. It says draconian comes from Draco, the, na the seventh century name of a, of a BC, seventh century BC, Athenian legislator uh, who created a written uh, code of law. Draco's code was intended to clarify pre existent laws, but its severity is what made it really memorable. In Draco's code, even minor offenses were punishable by death, and failure to pay one's debts could result in slavery. Uh, draconian, the dictionary says, as a result, became associated with two things cruelty and that which is harsh. Uh, why is that word cropping up in our culture? Uh, well, it's because it is, in some respects, shocking the level that our government has gone to in order to protect us. And uh, don't get me wrong, I am all for uh, the government taking control and defending us and protecting us, especially during a pan pandemic. And we've done a lot of uh, things uh, as Americans to uh, protect ourselves and protect others. I am all for that. However, uh, it seems, uh, as you watch this continue to unfold, that the state, or some of the nefarious uh, aspects of our state, uh, is using the situation to um, establish draconian laws, laws that are uh, overly harsh uh, when they don't really need to be. Uh, I'll give you a few items of interest. Uh, my former home state, the state of California, uh, this week, uh, Governor Newsom uh, did not like... Um, uh, you know, Amer the, the people going to the beach, too many people, especially in Orange County. So he, uh, he cut out, uh, you know, no one, he closed all the beaches in California. And that met with a stiff opposition from, uh, interestingly enough, surfers and people in, uh, uh, in the coastlines uh, were, n were not for that. But uh, I was talking to my brother-in-law last night who lives in San Diego and said the governor uh, relented and changed that. And uh, that uh, just uh, affected those in Orange County, but the rest of the state could basically go to the beach. But uh, to close down the entire coastline of the state of California uh, is, from the perspective of uh, the word in question, somewhat draconian. Uh, a few weeks uh, ago, I also read an article in, from San Diego um, about a police department on the border, I think it was Chula Vista, uh, who moved to purchase Ch Chinese manufactured drones in order to watch the movement of Americans to make sure that they were uh, observing state uh, social distancing laws. Who would have ever thought you would have seen that? Uh, a drone following you to make sure that you are being obedient to the government. Uh, San Francisco, uh, interesting. I lived not far from there for, before I moved here for about 19 years. Uh, San Francisco does some interesting things. Uh, during this particular outbreak, the government said that cannabis dispensaries were included as an essential business during the lockdown. Uh, Mind-boggling. Uh, Cannabis dispensaries are open, but, but you can't go to church. Uh, and speaking of church, uh, we probably all have read about how the, the church in Greenville, Mississippi, um, got together in the parking lot, and they were equally distant apart. They're all in their cars. They're going to hear the pastor preach across an FM channel. Um, the police showed up and ticketed every single parishioner uh, for showing up and, and breaking the law, as it were. Uh, and they all got $500 tickets. Unbelievable. And then I read last week, uh, on April the 16th, uh, the government has released 16,622 criminals who are awaiting trials uh, uh, anyway within prisons, but uh, supposedly these low-level criminals were released. But uh, as you dig down into the data, which I was doing this morning before I came to church, uh, some of them uh, were not low-level criminals, and have already uh, one particular individual has uh, already committed a crime uh, now that he's free. Un unbelievable. So it, it makes you ask, uh, wh what's going on here? I mean, we're all for protecting ourselves, but it seems like some states are going a bit over the top uh, to, to take control of the situation in, in a despotic way. 
what I think, from what I know from Scripture, uh, is when you study the Scriptures, uh, the, the last form of world government is state power, state, statism, totalitarianism. Uh, and what I think you see here is just a, what Jesus would talk about in Matthew chapter 24, the, the Sermon on the, the Olivet Discourse, uh, where he talks about the end of times, what to anticipate. Uh, if we take what Christ says there and look at what the prophet said in the Old Testament, especially Daniel, we understand that uh, the final government as a status power has to arise so the Antichrist can take over and rule and reign. And so what I think you see in a small way, uh, not in totality across our nation, but you see it in a shocking format, uh, is the state seeing just how much it can get away with, as it were, uh, to uh, take freedoms away from people and to control lives, to exert their, their version of uh, law and order, and to build their version of a utopia. It's interesting. Uh, Daniel uh, warned us of this. Uh, if you go back to our study in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verses 36 to 43, uh, and chapter 7, verses 2 to 9, uh, chapter 11 of the book of Daniel, verses 36 to 20 of 45, uh, he talks about uh, the final man of sin coming to be the ultimate statist, the man of sin, the lawless one, the Antichrist, who will rule uh, with extreme draconian measures. We are getting just a small taste of this, and how quickly this has come upon us is quite amazing. How should we as uh, Christians who understand prophecy and, and understand how even in our own time we're watching this being fulfilled, how should we as believers in God respond? Uh, that's a sermon in and of itself, but I'll give you two things to think about. Number one, uh, you should not be fearful. I have a lot of people asking me, uh, what is... What are we supposed to think about the events that are occurring in our world today in light of prophecy? Well, uh, how we should respond in light of what we see is we should not fear because God is in control. We should be defenders of truth at all costs because we know from the scriptures and prophecy that the world will descend into darkness uh, and believe the lie of the lawless one. Uh, and the world is going to turn against uh, God in a major way. And so we need to be the salt and light to our culture, teaching them about the, the greatness of the gospel of Christ, which can save. Number two, we should study Psalms like Psalm number two. Because uh, Psalm number two, uh, is a messianic psalm. Uh, it is also classified as a wisdom psalm because it's closely related with psalm number one, which tells you about the two paths you can walk on in life. The, you can choose a, a righteous, godly path, or you can choose a godless path. Uh, that particular psalm, uh, number one, merges with psalm number two, which talks about uh, the, the conflict between two kingdoms, the, the kingdom of Christ, uh, and the kingdom of man and of the devil. The two things are in opposition to each other. Uh, and as we study this wisdom psalm, uh, and it's gonna take us two weeks to do it because it, there's so much depth here, uh, it gives us hope. It gives us hope for the day in which we live because no matter how bad it gets, we understand from Psalm 2 that uh, the king's coming. Jesus is coming back uh, and nothing is going to thwart the arrival of his kingdom as prophesied. Uh, and Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24, that uh, there will be birth pains prior to the coming of the, of the kingdom. And, but as uh, a mother in labor knows, uh, when the baby is brought forth, how much joy is that? And so we keep those things in mind as we read Psalm 2, because it's going to tell us about the birth pains, but it's also going to point us to the king and his, and his arrival and how glorious that will be. So it builds hope into us. And we know that the king is going to come uh, as prophesied in this messianic psalm because of what Daniel said in chapter 2, verses 44 to 45. Here's what Daniel said. It says, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Uh, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king, this is Nebuchadnezzar, what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, uh, and its interpretation is sure. The dream is certain. Uh, the dream being uh, all those metallic images and that massive uh, vision of, uh, of, that, uh, of the idol that uh, Daniel saw were the final four, final world empires before the arrival of Christ and his kingdom. Uh, and what God tells uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel then tells Nebuchadnezzar is, uh, there is one coming who's going to strike at the base, the feet of all world empires, 
and destroy all of them because they have sinful issues and his kingdom of righteousness shall be set up forever. And he says, this is certain. I don't know about you, but it's wording like that that gives me great hope that even as I look at uh, my, my country, as it were, uh, doing unbelievable things uh, to control people beyond what's probably necessary, uh, we can see that statist power is limited because uh, it's going to be replaced when the king of uh, kings shows up. And that's what Psalm 2 is all about. So we should have uh, hope and we should prepare uh, for difficult times, but we shouldn't do it with, uh, with, with despair. We should do it with anticipation because of what this psalm teaches us. So as we look at this psalm, it has uh, three movements. Uh, we'll look at two movements uh, this morning uh, as it teaches us about the arrival of the messianic kingdom. Number one, it tells us what we should expect. It says uh, prior to the, the coming of the Messiah's kingdom, what should we expect? Uh, we should expect, as it says in the first three verses, the, the rebellion of man against God in a major way. Uh, since man's fall in the Garden of Eden, uh, he has been rebelling against the rule of God over his life. Uh, when the devil came to Eve and, and asked her the question, hath God said that you cannot eat uh, of, of every tree? She, she gave in to that and became uh, basically the, the ruler over her own life. Uh, man has been throwing out God's rulership since his fall in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and he's devised all kinds of clever philosophical systems uh, to, uh, to control others so that they don't have to rely upon God. Um, Last year I read a Nancy Piercy's uh, book, uh, and she's written a lot of books with Chuck Colson uh, when he was uh, alive. Uh, she wrote an excellent book, I think every Christian should read it. It's called Total Truth, uh, subtitled Liberating Christianity from Its Cultural Captivity. Uh, and she does an excellent job um, tracing in this, uh, in this uh, lengthy book uh, how man devises false systems to put himself on the throne and to dethrone God. Uh, and she goes through with a, with a fine tooth comb and analyzes all those false systems of belief that people uh, propose so they don't have to bow and bend to God. Marxism. Well, that's one thing that she, she covers. Uh, Marxism. Uh, Rousseau is another system that she covers. And Rousseau is behind much of uh, the political thinking of today. I mean, Rousseau back in the day, the French philosopher uh, thought that... Uh, uh, you know, man was created, you know, to, in an animalistic way to just enjoy himself and do whatever his desires led him to do. And that man's fall really relates to the constrictive things like family and having children. Those, from Rousseau's perspective, were bad. And the way that you get out of that uh, slavery uh, is you exercise the power of the state. Uh, so Rousseau is behind much of the things that we see today in despotic statism. But in all of those uh, things that she mentions, uh, you have what is prophesied here is man's desire to throw God off, to, to not uh, be subservient to God. Notice what the psalmist says. He says, why do the nations rage? We'll just stop right there. Why do the nations rage? Uh, in Hebrew, uh, the, the verse begins with a preposition uh, wedded to a, uh, a, a, a pronoun, an interrogative pronoun, uh, why, uh, uh, to make it extremely emphatic. So God starts Psalm 2 with a most powerful word to basically say, why in the world would, would man rage against me? Why would he do that? Uh, stressing the fact that that's impossible. The word rage, ragash in Hebrew, uh, uh, literally means a riotous, angry mob. That that's the way man will become prior to the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus. That prior to his coming, the world would degenerate into a nations, plural, having a state of, of, um, uh, uh, of riotous behavior about them. And, you know, you don't have to go very far to validate the premise of that today as you watch the news uh, just the, around the world uh, as people... Uh, tend to want to push away uh, following God uh, and, and embrace anything else other than God. Such are the uh, prophecies concerning the nations. They rage against God. This particular uh, statement, why do the nations rage, uh, is called erotesis. It's a, erotesis is a figure of speech. Uh, and if you study uh, uh, figurative language, uh, there's 19 ways to cl classify erotesis. This is number 17. Number 17 use of erotesis is... Uh, where a divine being, God, is asking a question to those whom he's created, stressing the fact that it's futile to resist him. 
Why would you ever think that you could rage against me, God says. Uh, it says here in a, in a parallel way in the second part of the verse, and why do the people plot a vain thing? Why do the people plot a vain thing? To plot uh, is the Hebrew word vagan, uh, and it's an onomatopoetic word which represents the, the sound of which it's speaking about. So the word for plot is the Hebrew word haga, uh, and it's a word that denoted a, 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 mum, a mumble, a murmur that was a, a low-toned uh, type of thing that you would hear. Like, like if you saw a couple of people together talking, but you couldn't quite make out what they were talking about, uh, that would be haga. It would, it would denote that noise in Hebrew that they were making as they spoke secretively. Uh, you couldn't quite make out the word. Uh, that word represents, uh, in, from the uh, psalmist's mind, how the, the nations think about God and God's reign over them. They are plotting vain systems to overthrow God. Uh, systems to overthrow God so they can rule and reign over their own lives, create their own utopia. Uh, but God says this is a vain thing. It's a vacuous thing to oppose God. Uh, it's a, the word to, for vain here is the word to be worthless. Uh, Anything that you use in your kitchen when you open a can of corn and, and dump it into the pot, uh, I mean, who wants to keep the can? Why, it's worthless. Um, you know, after you take a, you know, a bar of a soap out of a, uh, out of a box uh, and put the soap in the, in the shower, who keeps the box? I mean, what would you keep it for? It's, it's absolutely worthless. So God asked uh, two questions here. One stated outright, one implied. Why do the nation, nations rage against me? And then, why in the world do they think they could plot to overthrow me? That is absolutely, God says, worthless. It says in verse 2, what exactly the rulers are, are trying to achieve. Verse 2 says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Notice who it's against. It's against the Lord, that's Yahweh, the covenantal God, and against his anointed, that's the Messiah, that's the Messiah. What is the goal of, of world powers? Uh, to ultimately throw off God's rule in their lives. And boy, they're working over time to do that. So it doesn't matter. Uh, there's a variety of ways that can do that. They can abuse their power. Uh, they can use their prestige to get things that they want that are contrary to law. Uh, they can uh, push the, their godless agendas over unsuspecting people, which they do. Uh, but behind all of that is the devil uh, who challenged man from the very beginning to throw off the reign of God and to follow his own rule and reign. And so the psalmist says, as you look at the world around you and it begins to fall apart, why is it falling apart? Well, because man is trying to be his own God and, to get, and get God out of his life. Notice what it says in verse 3. It tells you exactly what their goal is. Uh, they say, God says, let us break their bonds. That's the Messiah, the Trinity, as it were. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. This is what uh, the academicians, the politicians, the philosophers, the thinkers behind the nations are thinking. Let us devise ways uh, to push God out of our lives, to push God's laws out of our lives, to push God's people out of our lives, and place ourselves there on that throne. Let's break their bonds. That's the bonds of God that man is responsible to. God says, uh, this, is, this is vanity. This is vanity. See, they, they see the existence of God, God's laws, God's rules, God's regulations. Uh, they see all of that as slavery. See, to me, I can look at the laws, rules, and regulations of the Old and New Testaments and see they, they give much life. They're, they're, they're uh, like a fence line. They're keeping you safe where there might be a cliff that drops thousands of feet. They're there to give you life and protection. Uh, but the godless look at the things of God and say, no, those are, those are restrictive. So it's like they, they're in bondage. And that's why when you look at our culture, uh, they're redefining everything. And things that used to be evil are now good. Uh, this is all in their attempts to become masters of their own fate. <coughs> There's many books uh, that have been written on this partic particular topic. <clears throat> I've read, I don't even know how many of them. Uh, last year I read uh, David Horowitz's Dark Agenda. Uh, years ago, I read uh, Patrick Buchanan's Suicide, Suicide of a Superpower. Excellent book. Uh, he also wrote uh, Death of the West. I think I read that back in the early 90s. <coughs> Charles Colson wrote Against the Night and also How Now Shall We Live. Um, and then Cal Thomas uh, wrote another good book that uh, he gave me uh, when I ran into him at, a, at an event one time. Uh, he wrote this book called What Works and What Doesn't Work. I mean, there's many books you can read <clears throat> to validate that man is trying 
uh, is best possible way to remove God from said culture and to oppose God's people. Um, I read this week uh, in China, uh, a pastor, his name is Jian Shu. Uh, he was uh, raised in China. He now serves as the director of the China Institute at Lincoln Christian University in Illinois. Uh, he was quoted this week as saying that the Chinese government uh, is currently trying to eliminate Christianity completely from public life. They're trying to expunge it completely. What, is, what does God say? Well, that is a vain thing. Uh, I read this week also from the American Center for Law and Justice uh, uh, of how Christian young people on university campuses are being uh, sidelined and persecuted uh, for their faith. Uh, they say that one student, his name is Brandon, was denied admission when he was asked in an admissions interview <coughs> what was the most important thing in his life. And he merely said, my relationship with God. They rejected his application uh, to radiation therapy program uh, and told him the next time you're asked a question, uh, don't say God's your greatest person. <coughs> and I don't think I have COVID, but <coughs> <coughs> I think I swallowed wrong. <coughs> it's hard to do humor online too because I can't hear anybody laughing. So <coughs> if you would be merciful, it would be great. Um, so Brandon was, you know, ejected from being able to apply in a medical program just because he said that, that the living God was the greatest person in his life. Unbelievable. You know, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said years ago, <clears throat> What, O you kings, do you think yourselves Samsons and the bands of omni omnipotence, but as green uh, new cords before you that you can snap at will? Well, the answer is no, you can't. You can't snap the cords of God. You can't defy God. <clears throat> so what can we expect uh, as, the, as the world moves in a despotic way of high status control? What we can, what we can expect is that's only going to get worse uh, because they're going to pursue this vain notion that they can control the world to create their utopia, which from God's perspective will really be a dystopia. Second thing, in verses 4 to 9, we see we should also expect God's reaction as people rebel. I mean, he never just sits uh, statically by as the Holy One who sees all things. Uh, he sees rebels and he responds. But it's interesting how he responds uh, in verse 4. How does God respond to the, the desire of man to throw off his rule and reign and to oppose his people? It says in verse 4, He, God, who sits in the heavens, shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. This is amazing. Uh, God looks at the godless in their attempt to try to overthrow them, him, uh, and he just laughs at them. Uh, this is a figure of speech called kleusmos. Uh, and kleusmos uh, denotes a sneering, uh, jeering uh, format against those who cannot possibly defeat you. I mean, God uses this figure of speech because he has all power, he has all knowledge, he has all wisdom, he has everything, and then he has puny little creatures trying to overthrow him and his people, thinking they can completely take control of the earth and establish their own uh, sinister kingdoms, and God says, uh, that's not going to happen. And God just sits on his throne and smiles and laughs like, that's not going to happen. I'm in control. See, for me as a Christian, Psalm 2 gives me great hope. Because as I watch my world slide into that which is illogical and dangerous, uh, God says, no, uh, I got my hand on the wheel. But, uh, but you might be the, the typical Christian, because many have talked to me, uh, to tell me that you are uh, you're concerned, uh, you are frustrated, uh, you're afraid, uh, and rightly so, because we live uh, in the middle of all of this. And you might uh, come to a certain degree to identify with Habakkuk, who was in a similar situation. Uh, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1, uh, listen to what Habakkuk says, and it might be kind of how you feel. Um, Habakkuk says in verse 1, the burden which the, the prophet Habakkuk saw. O Lord, he asked, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, I cry out violence and, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and, and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me, their strife and contention arises. Therefore, notice this, the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Boy, does it. I mean, you could say that is our day and age, where 
where the law is thrown to the wind. That which is true is thrown to the wind and replaced by that which is not true. You can see that there's perverted justice in our, even in our own country, day in, day out, where, where godly people receive perverse judgments against them. Much is twisted. It was the same way in Habakkuk's day. And, and Habakkuk has a burden on his heart for his country and says, God, how long do I cry out to you? Do something about this. I mean, stop this. He, from his perspective, it feels uh, to him like, well, God's not here. God's not listening. But verse 5 is most instructive. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 1, uh, he, he gets a word from God. What is it? He says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. Exclamation point. It says, for I will work, God says, a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told to you. This is an amazing word from God. Just when Habakkuk felt like all despotic power had taken over and, and the, uh, that which is righteous and holy in, in the culture, the godly people have been overthrown by godless people. Didn't like, like righteousness was going to ever win. God comes to him and tells him, no, I'm going to do something astonishing in your day. Something you did not anticipate because God says, I, I see what's going on. And I am going to move and do something about it. And you have to read the rest of the book of Habakkuk to see what God does. But God moves in a powerful way that wasn't anticipated by Habakkuk. See, I, I look at our nation this way as well because we too can feel as we see the, the state reach for, for more power. And when it gets more power, it doesn't usually relinquish it all too readily. As we see this happening, we should not lose hope because God, just like in the time of Habakkuk, is saying, hey, I'm going to do something amazing, something that's going to demand a, an exclamation point. Uh, and that's going to be, as we're going to study on uh, the rest of the psalm, the arrival of the King of Kings, Jesus. Uh, Hebrew uh, scholar uh, Charles Feinberg remarked concerning this passage. This is a Jewish uh, man who got saved many years ago. A great uh, teacher at Talbot Seminary uh, taught Hebrew. Uh, fine mind, a great saint of God. As he wrote about Habakkuk, uh, his words uh, are most appropriate to read. He says the silence of God in human affairs then as now has ever been difficult to understand. But this does not mean that there is not an answer, that the divine wisdom is incapable of coping with the situation. All is under his seeing eye and everything is under his control of his mighty hand. But in the meantime, the law was slacked, or the Hebrew word is chilled, rendered ineffective, paralyzed. Boy, isn't that the truth? says it came to be looked upon as being without force or authority. Probably because the people in Habakkuk's day thought the law was fluid. He goes on to say because of the unrighteous judges the law was set at naught. Since the forms of government of judgment were corrupted both life and property were insecure. He says justice could not prevail because the wicked knew how to hem the righteous in on all sides. So they, they could not receive justice. See that all the time in our culture. He says, the miscarriage of justice was the order of the day. Ensnaring the righteous by fraud, the ungodly perverted all right and honesty. Again, easy to validate in our day, just start reading the internet, where godly righteous people are ensnared by godless people to silence them. He goes on to say, because God did not punish sin immediately, man thought they could go on to sin with impunity. God is far from being an unconcerned spectator in earth's affairs. Feinberg says. He says, and this is the key, we can always be certain that if our hearts are stirred over the prevalence of sin and ungodliness, God is all the more deeply concerned. That's a wise man speaking. If you think that your heart is burdened by the darkness that you see and how quickly uh, the culture has thrown our rights to the wind uh, and how uh, amazing in a draconian way the, the culture has established all kinds of new laws uh, to supposedly protect us. I'm all for protection, but the harshness of it is quite shocking when you see it in the practical. But we should not ever be overly concerned because our concern is... is minuscule compared to the concern of God Almighty. And if God is concerned about the sin that he sees, we can better bake on the fact that he's going to do something about that. What he's going to do is listen in verse 5. We're going to get into this next week. I'll just read it to you. What's God going to do? It says, Then he shall speak to them, the godless, in his wrath, and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, You are my son, Today I've begotten you. This is the Father speaking to the Son, the Messiah, Jesus. 
He says, to, the father says to the son, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, all those false world empires. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. As easily as a potter could take a clay pot and strike it with a, 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 with a, with a rod of iron and break it instantly, God says, uh, I'm gonna one day step into world history, do an astonishing thing, destroy all former methods of rule and reign that are sinful, and I'm going to bring the Messiah, the King of Kings, to set up righteousness. This is the hope of the believer. I think about it all the time. As I look at the evil growing around me in the darkness, I don't lose hope because I have great hope in what lies ahead because the King is coming. There's an old song uh, that we used to sing, used to hear, uh, and I think... Uh, it's probably worth listening to today. I used to listen to it all the time. My parents had the record. Uh, but we need to play it today. I think it's a song here by the Oak Ridge Boys. Uh, and a little bit of this will probably do your soul well as you think about what lies on the near future. The King is coming. And we should be excited about that. 